All right, so we are going to continue our discussion about the somatic nervous system here where we're going to look more at the special senses. This particular lecture, we're going to focus in on the olfactory as well as the gustatory, so taste and hearing. So when we look at special senses, guys, the receptors for special senses such as smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium are anatomically distinct. They're all very different in their structures. And this is what makes them what we would consider special. Okay. So they're also going to be located in a very specific area. We talked about last time that the general senses are kind of spread out throughout your whole body. Your special senses are located in one particular area. So when we talk about vision, it's only in your eyes. We talk about taste, it's only on your tongue. Okay. That's the only place that those receptors are located. Now there are specific afferent pathways, like the pathways that go from those receptors to the brain for each of these. Okay, so they are going to be very unique in that pathway as well. There's going to be different parts of the brain that are also going to help with that perception and translation of that receptor information. If you look here at this particular slide, you'll see that they have some of the special senses shown here. We have the eye itself showing you its structure, but we also have over here the actual retina, like it's blowing it up so you can see the cells on the retina with those rods and cones collecting the light. So those are types of photoreceptors. We also see that you have, you can see in this next one that we have the actual taste bud. It gets its name because it looks like a bud and it's located in the tongue. And then we have two little structures here that you see with the ear. So you have the ear as a whole where you can see the outer, middle, and inner ear. And then the inner ear is blown up larger here with the cochlea and the semicircular canals for you to kind of look at. And so you can see that they're very distinct. They are very um, different in that type of receptor that we have present. So let's talk about olfaction and gustation first. Now olfactory is smell, whereas gustatory is taste. And guys, these impulses are what we would consider chemical senses. So these are gonna have what we would look at as chemoreceptors. They're going to pick up chemicals, changes in those um, chemicals, whether they are in the air and they get trapped in the mucous membrane in your nose, or they get dissolved in your saliva and they go onto your taste buds. They're gonna travel though with this information from those receptors to your cerebral cortex. One thing about these as well, and most of your senses and even your special senses especially, will travel through the limbic system. If you remember, the limbic system is where we can tag memories to them, we can tag more experiences to those sensations, and it makes them more meaningful. Now, this is why that you can have such a big emotional response or even have a trigger to some sort of strong memory when you smell certain things. Okay, so let's just say you lost a loved one who was really good at cooking and, and something smells like something they've made before, or maybe it's a perfume or cologne that smells like them. Another thing is even taste. Taste can bring back very vivid memories as well. Gustation and olfaction do work together. A lot of our um, senses do work together in a sense, but these two work together a lot because especially if olfaction is taken out of the picture where you can't smell, taste is very dulled. Okay, they do help each other. It enhances especially that taste sensation. So they do work together. Now olfaction is stronger and more sensitive than we would see for gustatory or taste. So let's talk about gustation first. Let's look at taste. So there's only five primary tastes that you can actually distinguish. We have sour, sweet, bitter, and salty, and those are the ones you probably normally have thought of. But there's also one called umami. Umami is kind of that savory type taste, like when you eat meat or have like a, a really good steak. Now, when we look at the receptors for gustation, you have approximately 10,000 taste buds on your tongue. Okay, now they're not just found on the tongue, they're located on the tongue, the soft palate of your mouth, your pharynx, which is your throat, and your larynx. Now, one thing to note is the number of taste buds do decrease with age. Now, this might explain when we'll talk about the different types of taste buds, why babies are kind of like super um, tasters. If you've ever tried baby food before, you would say, oh, that's really bland. But then when you feed that to your baby, they have a very like, they have a very like large reaction to it. Like they'll give you that really um, uh, face where they don't like it or they'll spit it at you because they taste it more than what you tasted. Another thing is when you switch them to 
table food, like real food, like from us instead of baby food, they won't go back to baby food. They like the taste of that original, that they like the taste of the other food. Another thing too is like when you give kids a, a babies a lemon and you see how they react, they pucker up a whole lot more than we do necessarily as an adult. It's because they can taste it better. It's higher concentration of those receptors. Now each taste bud is composed of about 50 what we consider gustatory receptor cells. They're also going to have some supporting cells around them and some basal cells. Now basal cells are like stem cells. Stem cells can become anything and in this case these stem cells will grow and become new taste buds and they are going to help support that taste bud area. And so you can kind of see the picture here where it actually looks like a bud or like a flower or maybe even kind of like an onion shape. We can see that this taste bud contains the taste pore with its little hairs that come off of those actual receptor cells, the gustatory cells. You also have those basal cells and supporting cells present. Now each gustatory receptor cell has one gustatory hair or microvillus that extends through that taste pore area which is on the surface of your tongue. Soft palate, pharynx, or epiglottis. So anywhere where taste buds are located, that's what the structure is going to look like. Now normally we say that they're on the tongue, but they are are located throughout your mouth and throat. Each gustatory receptor cell has a lifespan of approximately 10 days. When that particular gustatory cell has lived its 10 days, it dies off and then it gets replaced. Now we can shorten the life of these when we eat things that are too hot and we burn them. If you've ever taken that bite of pizza and the sauce was really hot and it burned and it made it where you couldn't taste anything really well for a couple of days, that's because you actually killed more of those taste buds than were ready to be um, replaced. So guys, there are four types of papillae on your tongue. They have different names and they have a little bit different function. So let's look at the first one. We have what we call this uh, circumvalte papillae. There's 12 of these and they're very large. They're located in a row on the back of your tongue. Okay, so you can see them here. They're located on the back portion of the tongue and each, each of these will house approximately each of these will house anywhere between 100 and 300 taste buds in them. So they're very large in their structure. We also see throughout your tongue, there's the fungiform papillae. The fungiform are more mushroom shaped. That's where they get their name. They're scattered over the entire surface of your tongue and they contain about five taste buds each. A lot less than that 100 to 300 we saw with the very large ones. We then have the folate papillae. These are located in small trenches on the lateral sides of your tongue. So the small sides of your tongue here. And they're going to degenerate in early childhood. So this might be the reason why kids have a more heightened sense of taste because these taste buds are activated when we are young children and they start to deactivate as we grow older. We also see that there are some papillae that are known as the filiform. The filiform papillae contain tactile receptors, so they allow you to distinguish different textures of food, but they don't actually help with taste. Okay, and so they help with different textures. I don't mind a lot of different tastes, but I am a texture person. So I like how banana tastes, but I don't like the texture of it. I like how mushrooms taste, but I don't like the texture of it. And so sometimes it's an issue with these filiform papillae of whether we like food or not, not necessarily the taste. Now, in order for you to actually taste these different substances from food, they have to be dissolved into your saliva. So they've got to be dissolved into a type of solution. And that's why we have the saliva that we produce. Now there is a threshold that varies between the different types of tastes and chemicals on how much you need in order for you to taste it. This is why some things, especially like certain spices, can go a really long way. You only need a little bit, okay, because they are very strong and their threshold is very small for you to taste it. Whereas other things have a more mild taste and so because of that you would need more of that particular spice in order to get a stronger taste. Adaptation for taste does also occur quickly, so you lose your sensitivity to taste pretty fast. And this is probably a good thing when we're talking about eating like a plate food, a, a plate full of different food. Okay, so you can switch between being able to taste the steak versus the potatoes versus the vegetables and so on. And that's because there's that adaptation that occurs so that you're not having that one taste lingering for a really long time for the most part. All right, so guys, let's talk about how when a gustatory receptor detects the substance, the chemical, what happens? How do we send that signal to the brain and you perceive it as a certain particular taste? 
When a gustatory hair is stimulated by some chemical, whatever it is, this causes a release of neurotransmitters. So NT here, guys, stands for neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters then cause a nerve impulse to travel through the neural pathway to the cranial nerve seven. Remember the facial cranial nerve seven does the first two thirds of your tongue. We talk about taste as well as cranial nerve nine, which is the glossopharyngeal and cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus. So those three cranial nerves are going to help you with being able to transmit the taste that's detected by your taste buds. From these three cranial nerves, the impulses are all going to go through the medulla. They're going to travel up the medulla to the thalamus. Hey, remember the thalamus is the relay station, so we're going to send the information where it needs to go from there. The limbic system is also spread out through here, and so there it will pass through that as well. Once it gets to its final destination, it's going to get to that cerebral cortex. The area of the brain that is the primary area for taste is known as your primary gustatory area. It's the base of your somatosensory cortex of the parietal lobe. So remember, parietal lobes are right here. It's going to be the very base. And guys, if you'll remember the somatosensory homunculus, the tongue was at the bottom. So taste is just below that. Okay. And so that's the idea of texture. You'd fill that and then taste would be really close in proximity in the brain. So it is located on the parietal lobe. All right, now that's pretty much what we need to know about the gustatory or taste sensation. Let's move on to olfactory. Now olfactory is a little more complex, but not a lot. So when we look at this, the receptors for olfactory or smell are going to be what we call bipolar neurons. So remember we talked about bipolar neurons in the sense that they have the cell body. And if it's bipolar, there's an extension through the top and there's an extension from the bottom. There's two extensions from the cell body. So these are those bipolar neurons. They are also located in your nasal epithelium. So the nasal epithelium is in your nose. It's that mucous membrane, and it's going to be at the very superior portion. So it's way, way up here. This is why a lot of times you may have to get a really good whiff of something like really deep breath into your nose in order for you to smell it. The mucus lining then dissolves the odorant molecules. So this again is a reason why you do need mucus in your nose is it helps dissolve the molecules that you're smelling. And the epithelial tissue provides the physical support, nourishment, and electrical insulation to these bipolar neurons that are present. Now the threshold of smell is very low. You only need a few molecules in order to smell something. Hey, okay, this one is a lot more sensitive than we see with like taste and touch and that sort of thing. And so because of this, you don't have to bathe in that cologne or perfume or that sort of thing because you're going to be able to smell it pretty well with even just a few particles. Adaptation though for smell does occur very quickly. You lose sensitivity to odors pretty fast. And we talked about this back in the last one and the idea that if you were to run over a skunk, eventually you don't smell it anymore. But if somebody gets in the car, they can still smell it. The odorants are still there. You're just not sensitive to it anymore. Or like when you turn a Scentsy or you light a candle in your house, you may even forget you had it on because you're not sensitive to the smell. You leave and when you come back, you're like, Oh my gosh, I smell that. I must have left that on. Okay. And so that's what we see with that idea of adaptation for smell. Olfactory receptors live about a month before they get replaced. So we saw with gustatory, they were 10 days here. They live about a month before they do get replaced. Now, they can be harmed or damaged by airborne toxic chemicals. This is one reason like with certain kinds of smells and chemicals, like with cleaning supplies and things like that, it could potentially hurt and hinder your um, sense of smell. And a lot of that has to do with it kind of burning that mucous membrane and epithelial layer. All right, so let's talk about the pathway of how we get that odorant dissolved and how it travels to the brain for you to interpret it. So when an odorant molecule or chemical stimulates an olfactory receptor, so receptor detects it because it's been dissolved into that mucous membrane, a, it generates a potential, okay, when we talk about that in action potential. Now this one is one of those graded action potentials. Remember, we need enough in order for depolarization to actually occur. When depolarization occurs, it exceeds that threshold, and now we're sending the signal, it sends the nerve impulse down, and that, remember, now is called an action potential. So AP here is talking about action potential.
The axons of several olfactory receptors do merge together into the connective tissue between your nasal mucosa, okay, so inside your nose, and your cribriform plate. Remember the ethmoid bone kind of looks like a um, spaceship, and the cribriform plate runs this way. And there's little bitty tiny holes called the olfactory foramina. That's where these guys are going to connect, okay? And so they're going to travel through those tiny holes and be able to, to kind of clump together and connect into that olfactory nerve. So each bundle of axons are going to create an olfactory nerve. There is one on each side and there are approximately 40 of those axons combined together to make that nerve. Now, the axon terminals of the olfactory nerves then extend through the cribriform plate through those tiny little holes we talked about called the olfactory foramina. And they come into synapsis or connection with the dendrites of multipolar neurons on the olfactory bulbs. Now, remember when you did the brain dissection, you saw those olfactory bulbs. They're on the underside of the brain and you can see them very clearly. That is where we're going to then transmit the signal. It goes from the olfactory nerve to the olfactory bulb. That olfactory bulb is going to be mostly composed of gray matter. So dendrites and cell bodies. We do see that there's one of them on each side of the crista galli. So remember, cribriform plate runs this way, and the top of the ethmoid bone had that little extension called the crista galli. There's going to be one on each side. These olfactory bulbs then extend into olfactory tracts. And remember when we call it a tract in the central nervous system, this means it is myelinated and it's those axons that are present. They extend posteriorly, so they go back towards the brain, carrying the impulses to your cerebral cortex. And they do also travel through the limbic system. Remember that emotion area of your brain. Okay, so ultimately they do travel and they're going to go to the kind of that primary area for smell, which part of that is in that hypothalamus, which we talked about back in the brain chapter. All right, so that finishes up talking about olfaction. Again, gustatory and olfaction, taste and smell are not as complex as what we're going to see with hearing and vision. All right, and vision especially, that's why it has kind of its own lecture for that. But now we're going to switch gears. We talked about taste. We talked about smell. Let's talk about hearing. All right, so when we talk about hearing, the main structure we need to look at is the ear. The ear has three principal regions to it, okay? So it has three kind of sections to it, and they're highlighted here in this picture. So we see the kind of yellowish gold color is known as your external ear. It's going to use air to collect and channel sound waves into the inner part, the middle and inner part of your ear, okay? And so it's going to use this external auditory meatus, this hole right here that's in the temporal bone, and it's going to help funnel the air and sound waves into your ear. The middle ear is going to be made up of a system of little tiny bones. So it's a bony system. And the whole point there is that it's going to take the sound from traveling in the air and it's going to transmit it then into the bone. This amplifies, it makes the vibrations larger. So it amplifies the sound to continue to travel. It then will travel into the inner ear. The inner ear is going to be this kind of peachish, I don't know, kind of like bright, light, light brown color here. It's going to be where the actual sound waves, that amplification of sound waves is going to then be converted into action potentials on the nerves. So we're going to go from an actual mechanical movement of waves to that electrical action potential. It then will transmit the sound as well as balance information because the inner ear does sound and balance to the brain. Okay, so those are the three parts. So let's take a little closer look at each of them. So the external ear is going to collect the sound waves and pass them inward into kind of your skull. And there's a couple of structures here we want to look at. The first is the oracle. The oracle is also known as the pinna, and it's this funnel shaped structure that we would call your ear. Okay, that's this particular structure. Now, this funnel shaped structure is composed of mostly elastic cartilage as well as a covering of skin. We then see in the very center part right here, we have what we call the meatus. A meatus is a tunnel. This part's known as your external auditory meatus because it opens out to the outside world. It is a curved tube that travels through the temporal bone itself. It does contain some specialized glands called the ceruminous glands. These are a special sudoriferous gland that secrete cerumen, which is earwax. So they have a special structure here that's going to secrete earwax. This earwax does have a purpose. It's to protect the middle and inner ear from like dust particles and, and different invaders. 
We then see at the very back of the external ear, there's what we call the tympanic membrane, also known as your eardrum. This is a thin covering over the middle ear. So we see that it's the kind of break or separation between the external ear and the middle ear. It is going to be composed of simple cuboidal epithelium. Oh, this is going all the way back to tissues back in anatomy one. So when we say simple, it means one layer. Cuboidal are cube cells. So this is one layer of cube cells. However, it's also going to have a little bit of elastic and um, collagen connective tissue spread out through there. And this is so that it can actually vibrate like a drum. Now, we do want it to have where sound hits it and it does vibrate. However, sometimes the sound or something can happen where the eardrum gets broken. It gets ruptured. This is known as a perforated eardrum. This is when there's a hole that's created inside that tympanic membrane. This is going to reduce your hearing ability because we cannot amplify and actually send those vibrations on as well because it's a broken structure. We see that it's going to affect your hearing. There's a lot of different things that can cause a perforated eardrum. Some of them include like compressed air. If somebody comes up behind you and boxes your ears real quick and forces air in them, it could rupture an eardrum. Diving, because you're going into a deeper level where pressure is different and then you come back up, it could cause a rupture. Explosions. In the movies, when they have those explosions going on and they're just, they just continue to walk without any kind of... Um, care that what's going on behind them. That's not true. Explosions can actually cause major issues in your ears. It causes a ringing and it can rupture the eardrum. Another one, of course, is just trauma. If you have trauma to the head region, it could cause issues. And also one of the big ones, and it happens a lot of times in kids, is middle ear infections. If the middle ear gets really infected and full of fluid, it pushes on the tympanic membrane until it bursts. That causes major issues and it can cause um, hearing issues later on in life because when the tympanic membrane heals back up, it's going to have scar tissue and scar tissue. Yeah, it fixes the problem, but it does not act like the original tissue. So you're going to have some potential hearing loss with that. All right, so let's move on to the middle ear. The middle ear is known is right behind the tympanic membrane. So a lot of times it's called the tympanic cavity. This is an air filled cavity in the temporal bone and it is lined with epithelial tissue or epithelium. We see in this particular area, there is a tube that connects from your middle ear down to your throat. This is known as your auditory or astuchian tube. It's made of bone and cartilage. It does lead from the middle ear to your nasopharynx, which is a particular part of your throat by where your nose also connects. Now, it's closed normally at the throat end. Um, but there are times where we need to open up that throat end in order to equalize pressure in our ears. And this is what we do when we say, Hey, I need to pop my ears. And we do that by like chewing gum or maybe opening your mouth really wide with, like, with a yawn or you for that kind of pop. What happens there is that the end in your throat opens up and it equalizes pressure from inside your ear to your mouth. We also see in babies, especially like when they fly, they have problems because of the change in pressure. So sucking on a pacifier or feeding on a bottle or breastfeeding will help them with their ear pain a lot of times. Now, if inside and outside pressure are not balanced inside your ear, the eardrum can't vibrate properly. And that's why sound, sound, it, um, things sound different. They don't have that they, they sound more muffled when that occurs. It could also be very painful and you may even get a ringing in your ears. In very severe cases, it can also cause you to have vertigo, which is where you feel like the room is spinning when you didn't do anything to cause that. Like you didn't spin in circles to make yourself dizzy. Now, pathogens, though, from your nose, because this is a pathway up into the ear, sometimes when you get sick and you've got like a head cold with your nose and your throat, pathogens like bacteria or viruses can travel up this tube and they can cause middle ear infections. This is very common in babies, toddlers, and even young children. As we get older, we tend to see that ear infections are not as much of an issue. However, there are still some adults who have chronic ear infections. 
Also inside of this structure, this tympanic cavity, we have the auditory ossicles. The auditory ossicles are the middle ear bones. They're these tiny little bones. So when we talked about the bone chapter, remember the femur was your largest bone in your body. These three are the smallest bones in your body. We have the um, malleus, which is the hammer shaped bone. This is connected to the inside of your eardrum, your tympanic membrane, and it is going to have what we call the synovial joint. Remember the joint that has a cavity around it filled with fluid to allow for movement. It's also then going to attach or articulate with the incus. The incus is the next small bone and it is anvil shaped and it articulates with the malleus and the stapes, which is the next one. The stapes is a stirrup shaped bone and it articulates with the incus. It articulates with a structure called the round window, which has the secondary tympanic membrane. Now these three bones, like I said, are super small. Over here in this picture, I have them where it shows you like their size in relation relation to a dime. They can all fit on a dime very easily. It also shows you the cochlea and semicircular canals that are part of your inner ear. They also are super small. Okay. So they do a lot of work for us, but they're very small in their structure. Now these auditory ossicles are held in place by several ligaments and two specific muscles. The base of that stapes does fit into an area called the oval window. It's a thin layer of bone between the middle and inner ear. It is covered with the membrane, okay, and that's known as that round window that has that secondary tympanic membrane. So what happens here is when sound hits your first eardrum, okay, your tympanic membrane, your eardrum, it causes it to vibrate. Now, when it vibrates, that malleus is attached to it. And so when it vibrates, it vibrates the malleus, which in turn vibrates the incus and the stapes, and then the secondary tympanic membrane. So this allows for the conduction, the movement of those sound waves. Now, when we did the bone chapter as well, we talked about different types of um, joint replacements, like knee replacements, shoulder replacements, hip replacements. The smallest joint replacement that you can have done is a stapectomy where they can they can actually remove your stapes in your ear and put in an artificial one. Okay, it's the smallest joint replacement that can be done. All right, so now let's move on to the internal ear, or what we would call the inner ear. This inner ear area is kind of like a labyrinth, meaning it's a maze of kind of structures. There is an area known as the bony labyrinth that's located in the um, temporal bone itself, and it's going to be kind of an area cut out in order for this to fit in here. It contains the structures of the semicircular canals, which you can see here, and they help more with equilibrium. We also have the vestibule, which is an opening area that kind of connects the semicircular canals to the round window, to the cochlea. It's going to be mostly for equilibrium as well. And then you have the cochlea itself. The cochlea is the one that looks like the snail shell, and it contains your actual receptors for hearing. Now the round window or that secondary tympanic membrane is near where the vestibule and cochlea meet. Inside the cochlea is what a structure called that spiral organ, also known as the organ of Corti, and it has coiled sheets of epithelial cells, and these are actually what we would consider the organ of hearing. It's the place where hearing is really going to take place. Now, the organ of Corti contains thousands of these little hair-like cells, and they contain a lot of those little extensions called the microvilli. Inside the bony, bony labyrinth is what we call a perilymph. It is a fluid, and this fluid is very similar to cerebrospinal fluid. Inside the bony labyrinth is also a membranous labyrinth. It's a series of sacs and tubes that are located inside, and you can see them there where they're kind of like this pinkish color versus the red color. They are going to be lined with epithelium, and they contain endolymph. So they also contain a fluid, but this fluid is similar to what's found inside of your cells, your intracellular fluid known as your cytoplasm or cytosol. Okay? So even though both of them are a type of liquid, um, their properties are a little bit different. The one that's more like cerebral spinal fluid may have different chemicals or concentrations of chemicals in them versus the, the endolymph, which is more like what's inside the cells. All right, so let's talk about the process of hearing. How do we take those vibrations that go into the ear and they actually allow our brain to figure out what we are listening to? 
Well, we see if first the oracle is going to direct sound waves into the external auditory canal. It has this funnel shape on purpose. Think about it. When you're trying to really listen to something, what do you a lot of times do? You make that funnel bigger. You make it bigger so that you can hear it better. Or if you're listening like through a wall or a door, you might even do this so that you can hear it better. Sound waves then will strike the tympanic membrane. This causes it to vibrate and move. Low pitch sounds cause slower vibrations, whereas high pitch sounds cause rapid vibrations. This is why high pitch sounds sometimes can hurt your ears. Vibrations then get conducted through the tympanic membrane, okay, through the eardrum to the ossicles. And the structure goes from the, the sound wave goes from the malleus to the incus to the stapes. Movement of the stapes then pushes the membrane of the oval window in and out. This movement of the oval window causes the fluid to move in that perilymph. So that perilymph fluid inside the cochlea starts to move. Now, guys, this is very similar to how they make waves in a wave pool. In a wave pool, they take the machine and it goes up and down. And as it hits the water, vibrations are created and the waves start moving. Same thing here. As it moves through and those bones are hitting that water, it's causing waves to move through that perilymph in the cochlea. Now these pressure changes, these waves that are created in the perilymph cause that round window to bulge out into the middle ear even more. These pressure changes in the perilymph also cause pressure changes in the endolymph. So one of the waters moving causes the other set of water to move. This eventually causes the hairs, those little microvilli we talked about in the spiral organ, the organ of Cordy, to start to bend. Bending of these hairs opens mechanically gated ion channels. Now this goes way back to when we looked at chapter 12, when we were talking about the how a nerve impulse happens. Those mechanically dated, gated channels open up. This leads to receptor potentials that we call those graded potentials. When enough of the graded potential has occurred, this is going to open up the voltage gated channels. And specifically here in the ear, these are going to be calcium channels that get opened because of this. Those calcium channels, as those voltage gated channels came down, allow calcium to rush in. This is going to cause them to release these particular cells to release a neurotransmitter. Okay, it's going to do this through what we remember called exocytosis. So exocytosis of that neurotransmitter sends it to stimulate the next nerve. The nerve impulse travels to the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear cranial nerve, cranial nerve eight. It then carries the impulses to the medulla. Here, the neural pathway crosses to the opposite side. So this is kind of weird. What you hear from this ear is going to cross to the opposite side of your brain and vice versa. It travels through the midbrain, the thalamus, because remember the thalamus is the relay station, to the cerebral co cortex on the opposite temporal lobe. So again, what I'm hearing in this ear, my left ear, is going to be processed on the temporal lobe of my right side. And what I'm hearing in my right ear is going to be processed on the temporal lobe on my left side. So there's a crossing over that takes place here. So this picture kind of shows you the process. So it shows you the tuning fork. We hit the tuning fork. You're listening to the sound. It travels into the ear, hits the tympanic membrane, causes those ossicles to move back and forth. The ossicles then cause the fluid inside of the inner ear to start to move, the perilymph and the endolymph. Those both then cause those little hair-like extensions of the organ of cordy to start to bend. And you see they have blown that up here in this bottom picture. Once they bend enough, they send the signal down the cochlear branch of cranial nerve eight. Okay, so this is showing you that it travels through cranial nerve eight. Now, another thing that the ear does is the ear also helps us with equilibrium or balance. Now, equilibrium is another function of the inner ear, but it's controlled by a different area. So the cochlea was for hearing. Okay, this other structure that's highlighted in the picture, the vestibular apparatus, is what we use for balance. Now, this particular apparatus is made out of semicircular canals. You can see that they kind of go halfway around. So one goes up this way, one goes to the side, one kind of goes at an angle. The whole point of having these in different directions is this, would al it'll, this allows you to sense your head position, okay? What your head is doing, whether you're going from side to side, front to back, circles, it's detecting those things, 
okay? So head movement, head position. It also is gonna help you know whether or not your body is in motion, if it's moving. Now there's two types of equilibrium that this structure has to account for. The first is static equilibrium. Static equilibrium refers to your state of balance relative to the force of gravity. All right, so gravity is a force that's always acting on you. And so because of that, this area is helping you um, accommodate that, being able to navigate that. Now, of course, there's times when we are moving and we trip that gravity gets the best of us and we fall on the ground. Okay, but this area tries to help you keep your balance. That's why sometimes you might stutter step and maybe you catch yourself and you didn't even fall. Okay, this area would help with some of that. The other is dynamic equilibrium. This is involved in the maintenance of balance during very sudden movements. So in reality, you're using both of these, okay? Unless you're just sleeping. If you're just sleeping, okay, you're mostly using static equilibrium. But if you're up and moving, you're using both because gravity is working on you constantly, but then you're also moving. And as you move your head and things like that, you don't want to lose your balance every time, okay? So these structures are going to help with that. So guys, when we look at these structures, we do have an area that's called the vestibule. Now a vestibule, the name kind of comes with it being an open area. A vestibule or a foyer of a house is the area you first walk into. In this vestibule area of the semicircular canal region, we see that there is some two areas called the urticle and the saccule. Both of those are gonna help more with kind of like the static equilibrium. In these structures, whether it's the semicircular canals or the urticle or and saccule, they have these hair-like extensions, those microvilli, kind of similar to the organ of Cordy, but a little different, protruding out, and there's fluid that flows over these. So as your head moves in different directions, the fluid is going to move in those directions, and these hairs are going to bend, allowing your brain to get the signal of knowing what your head is doing, whether you're looking down, or you're looking up, or you're looking to the side. It's sending those signals because the water moves across those structures. This is going to travel then down the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So cranial nerve eight is still going to send this signal, but it's the vestibular branch that carries it, not the cochlear branch. Okay. Um, the semicircular canals also have these type of hair-like extensions, but you'll notice they look a little different. They're kind of in these capsulated areas called the capula, or amp and they're located in ampulla areas. But as the fluid moves through those canals, they flow and it sends a signal of those movements. Okay. Now this is the area though that can really make you dizzy. Okay. When you're going around in circles, all the fluid starts moving in that same circle and then when you stop, it's still moving. And so that's why you feel dizzy and you kind of lean to the side. However, we can train this area. We can work on this area so the fluid doesn't get spinning in our head. And that's what dancers do, specifically ballerinas, where they can do spin after spin after spin after spin and they don't get dizzy. This has to do with them being able to whip their head and focus on something specific to help control the movement of this fluid as it moves through these structures. All right, so this is just looking at those different structures that help with equilibrium. All right, so this finishes up us talking about olfactory action, so smell, gustation, taste, hearing, and equilibrium, which are part with the ear. So we do see that we've looked at four of the five special senses in this particular section. We'll continue our discussion of the other special sense vision in our next lecture. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Mm -hmm.